another Stinkle of the Drinkle. Welcome to the Scrawny Life. This episode is off the rails already, so let's roll right into a species spotlight. Boletus rubro flavius this time, a toxic red capped bolete, which is mycorrhizal, so it emerges from the ground. Generally on hillsides in oak hickory woodlands, not only is the cap red, but the hymenium, that layer of tubes underneath the cap, is red as well, and the stem is mostly red. The amount of reticulation on the stem seems to vary quite a bit, so I don't consider that uh, any longer a reliable identification criterion. Here's a look at the staining progression. It does result to black, or maybe the blue, it just appears black against the red background. Anyway, jumping into Photoshop and the digital painting we're working on, uh, the day has come to add some broken color effects to the sky so it doesn't look quite so computer generated, uh, starting with some directional strokes that are supplementary to the color immediately around them even though the uh, color scheme overall is complementary. Uh, then we'll use the mixer brush to smooth that down with some more random strokes. And here we could come in with a custom brush tip to really get that painterly look going, but I want to skip that at least for now until the clouds are in place. And we'll wrap this up with a few strokes of color that are high chroma, or they differ from the surrounding color um, very little in terms of hue or value, but they uh, are more saturated or higher in chroma, which will just give the sky a little bit of life. So let's build a video transition. We'll stay in Photoshop for the moment to create the figure. Uh, I wanted it to kind of look like a comp sketch. So I'm leaving some of the sketch lines instead of erasing them or, or creating a new layer for the drawing. So we'll flip it around, get some of the basics laid down, then we'll flip it around and check the proportions of everything, make a few adjustments fix the hat a little bit, then drop in the background color and begin shading with just black and white.
All right, let's bring that into Adobe After Effects and run through the layers. The top layer is a hidden fractal noise layer that's animated to drive the flame effect on the logo. The second layer is the wipe out, and the third layer is the wipe in. They've been thresholded down to just black and white with a color key applied to the white in this case. And when we import that into Premiere Pro, we'll apply a color range key to the black. The fourth layer is the text. It's been given a compound blur that's mapped to another fractal noise layer at the very bottom of the stack. And that is not animated, but the, 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 the border radius on the compound layer is, is animated to give it that uh, watercolor bleed effect in the last few seconds of the uh, clip. The fifth layer is, the, is our figure drawing, which also has that same blur applied. The logo is two layers. The upper layer uh, has the um, has a glow uh, that's animated, of course, and uh, some fractal noise to give it a little visual interest. But hidden directly underneath is the same shape with a white fill and several effects applied, but mostly a displacement map and a compound blur mapped to the hidden animated noise layer we mentioned at the top of the stack. To create the flames. The compound blur does not produce as detailed of, an, of a bleed effect as the camera lens blur would, but the render time on the camera lens blur is much longer. It could take half an hour to render this clip if it, if it uh, used the camera lens blur instead of the compound blur. And then there's an exposure effect and an unsharp mask to get the color and the shape of the flames to look a little more convincing. There we can see the red exposure at 100%, the green at zero, and the, we're taking some blue out to give it the, the proper color. And our unsharp mask set to 125. Overall, fairly efficient. It took about two minutes to render. Jumping back into Photoshop for my first attempt at frame-by-frame -frame animation, as I mentioned before, I'm most familiar with animating a rigged model with keyframes and curves and all that. Uh, since the action was only about two seconds, I figured I could go with a straight-ahead approach, but the motion is pretty jerky, so next time I'll sketch out a full storyboard and get the motion looking right first before I fill everything in. Uh, I, I was surprised how quickly things drift off course in, in just a straight ahead approach. Uh, I mean, a minor distortion that at one point would become a major you know, distortion a couple frames later. And it's really, it's, it's really quite simple in terms of shape and movement, you know, something more complicated uh, like, a, uh, like a face turning toward or away from a strong light source, <clears throat> light source, I think would be really difficult. Uh, I definitely found a new appreciation for people who do this. So, all right, let's tie some clouds or minnow variations. Uh, using a plain old size four bait holder hooks here instead of jig hooks. We will start by building the base, uh, a monofilament keel that keeps the dumbbell from twisting around the shank of the hook. Uh, we'll secure the dumbbell and then a strand of 20 pound monofilament, which will be pulled under the dumbbell on one side, over the shank and back under the dumbbell on the opposite side. And that is then pulled down quite tight and wrapped down and then, you, so you can see that the dumbbell cannot twist around the shank of the hook. Because how many times have you missed a strike and then only to realize that your, the dumbbell or your clouds or minnow is twisted around to the other side of the hook? And my apologies, I don't have a permanent filming station set up in the home office room. So the autofocus on this camera, it doesn't have a, a permanent macro mode, so it's going to try to focus on the wall and everything. but the actual fly, but hopefully you can still see well enough to kind of get the idea of what's going on here. 
And later on, we'll come in with a little bit of uh, Gorilla Glue and really lock that down. But right now, we're just uh, we're going to put a little uh, a little Mylar tinsel down, wrap that in. Nice and strong. It's more about strength than, than about looks at this point. Get a few more X wraps going here. And now we'll test it. We'll give this the old test and see whether that dumbbell twists or not. Rock solid. It does not move. That dumbbell will no longer twist around the shank of the hook. So we'll wrap all the way back. Flip that over. So now it goes in a little uh, chartreuse Swapsy Supreme hair. We'll just wrap that down, uh, leaving the, the part that will become the tail is now sticking out over the head. And there goes that Gorilla Glue, and then we're going to wrap the tinsel over that. And that's really going to lock everything down. So now we need just a little bit of flash. Draw in those white bass from a little bit further away. This is this is the sort of fly I was using in the, the first few episodes when we were uh, catching white bass out there at Lake Red Rock. But yeah, you know, a very versatile fly. I mean, that would work for smallmouth or just about anything. And it's it's sparse enough; it could be cast. Uh, with the micro Skagit gear as well, um, so be a great uh, be a great fly uh, up there at Palisades Kepler. We did an episode up there. Um, all right, so this one has the same understructure, and we're just using a little bit of flash for the dressing, uh, but we're going to uh, we're going to build a little bit heavier head using a dubbing loop here. Just, you know, pushes a little bit more water, yeah, it makes a little more noise, has a little more flash. So we'll put in some uh, sparkle dub and a little, uh, I can't even remember what that uh, flash fiber is now. Um, but uh, a dab of that, got a little too uh, far ahead, so back that up and, and rewrap it. That looks good now. Bring the uh, tail material over and wrap that down. Get that all looking good. Clip off the dubbing loop. Now we'll smooth that down and we'll give it just a couple X wraps to kind of hold everything in place. Tie it down. There she is. Brush it out just a little bit and trim the tail. A little head cement. So, yeah, that. Uh, that would definitely catch those white bass out there. Number four, bait holder hook. Uh, it's like a 532nd uh, dumbbell eyes. Basic Clouser variation. Not even Elon Musk can save the internet from how dumb my walk cooking segment is. Uncle Roger will take his leg off the chair and then throw the chair out the window when he sees this. But uh, look, I'm, I'm still learning, learning something new every time, trying new things. Things did get a little crispy this round, not going to pretend they did it. Uh, I had uh, meatballs made with ground lamb and then shredded carrots and onions for the vegetables. And the aromatic mix was uh, grated ginger and garlic and some green onions. And I was using soy sauce and Chinese black vinegar for the sauce, which I found doesn't really need a cornstarch slurry. You can just add those and it will emulsify pretty much any excess oil that's laying around. After a few heats of the, the lamb and vegetable mix, I did a quick couple of heats of uh, some pre cooked noodles, then combined the two, the, the lamb and vegetables with the noodles to create one meta dish. <laughs> meta dish, take that Zuckerberg. Anyway, it wasn't too bad. I mean, needless to say, I need a lot of improvement on the technique, but it's a lot of fun trying.